I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Eric Hazeltine, an author, futurist, and neuroscientist. He's held several senior executive positions in private industry and the public sector. He was an associate director and CTO for National Intelligence at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Director of Research, the National Security Agency, an executive vice president at Walt Disney Imagineering, and a director of engineering at Hughes Aircraft Company. For the past few years, he's been developing new forms of digital media, entertainment, and advertising, in addition to cutting-edge cyber and industrial security solutions. Eric has authored or co-authored 15 patents in optics, special effects, and electronic media. In addition, he's published over 100 articles in Discover Magazine, on Discover.com, and in journals such as Brain Research and the Society for Neuroscience Proceedings. He maintains a blog on psychology today. His book, Long Fuse Big Bang, shows how to prevent the tyranny of the urgent from trumping the pursuit of the important. And he is the author of The Listening Cure with Dr. Chris Gilbert. So, Eric, welcome, sir. Our focus today is another book of yours, The Spy in Moscow Station, which is basically a spy counter spy thriller based on true events. Can you start us out with a little bit of the backstory behind it and what inspired you to write this book? I had a mentor, if you will, who was on the NSA advisory board named Charles Gandy. And when I first took the job as the director of research at NSA, I had come from Disney and I didn't know anything about the intelligence business. And he knew that. <clears throat> so he took me aside and uh, told me there were certain things as director I needed to pay attention to, which in his opinion had fallen by the wayside over the years. And they have to do with a spy craft called standoff attacks. Mm. And a standoff attack is how to, without putting a bug or an implant in a computer or a room, gather data and voice and other information uh, from a distance remotely. And so uh, he told me a story. And in the book, I actually tell how I got started on that effort <clears throat> by a story that he told me. And that story turned into the book. Ah, OK, OK. And so the Soviets were known to be bombarding the Moscow embassy with high power EM signals and microwave radiation in Gandhi's day. And he argued that the Soviets were using radiation to exploit implanted listening devices as a type of electronic surveillance. Is that kind of what you're describing in terms of standoff attacks? It is, although <clears throat> standoff attacks can use implanted devices, but they can also work without any implant at all. For example, if you flood a room with a radar, that's a really high quality, low phase noise radar, you can recover voice just from its reflection off the human larynx. Mm. And you can recover uh, other kinds of signals too without having any implant. And um, the original standoff attack was the Moscow Embassy Great Seal Bug of the late 1940s and early 1950s. We called it the thing. It was a completely passive device that was undetectable because it had no power, it just reflected radiation from a illuminating radar. And it was the world's first RFID, basically. You know, your little RFID that you put in your credit card and you put it down when you go to McDonald's and pay. <clears throat> that technology was actually invented by the KGB in the late 40s by a guy named uh, Theremin, who also invented the Theremin musical instrument. <clears throat> and he was something of a genius, but that was the original standoff attack. Uh, later in the 70s, there were what we call mutts and tums, Moscow unidentified signal, the unidentified Moscow signal. And that was a range of radar flooding type signals in the embassy that probably had to do with both implants and other more passive ways of gathering information. Okay. And we're definitely going to touch on this more as we go on, because this comes to, I, I want to get into Havana syndrome later. And and mm -hmm. so I, I guess it's probably important for people to imagine if you're flooding a room with high power microwave band, right? Radar information, or you know, it, it, that's going to cause issues for a lot of people. Well, um, 
I'm not sure about that. There's a lot of controversy. And first of all, the levels of radiation in the original Moscow attack were not very high. Mm. They were actually not over what we in our country now deem to be a safe level of uh, radiation, which is, um, you know, like uh, 10 milliwatts per square centimeter or something like that. Um, it is interesting to note, however, that the Russian and Chinese standards for what is safe are quite a bit lower by a factor of 10 than ours. And wow. it, that's an interesting question is based on what? And uh, the fact is the Russians have done a tremendous amount of research on the effect of radio frequencies on biological tissue, much more than we have. And <clears throat> I suspect that those standards are based on some knowledge which they have not made public. But um, the fact of the matter is, generally speaking, the Moscow radiation was not super high power. And there were uh, various studies done by John Hopkins and others to look at the health effects because some people claim that they had birth defects, uh, blood cancers and things like that based on the radiation. And I'm not sure the data is strong enough to suggest that that in fact happened. That isn't to say that <clears throat> RF radiation in other forms couldn't cause uh, problems. And I believe in fact it can. But um, the original Moscow signal says so really the jury is out on whether that caused any harm. Ah, okay. Well, and so with the Moscow station, from what you've written, if, if I understand correctly, there was kind of a hidden corridor where they had a movable antenna, right? If I understand that correctly. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then they also had bugs implanted. For instance, they were in IBM Selectric typewriters. They, they had little bugs there. And these were these kind of the theremin type you described? where they would reflect signals? Um, no, uh -huh. no, that was a completely different thing. I mean, when Gandhi went over to Moscow, what happened was <clears throat> around the late seventies, what we call assets, what your average civilian would call a spy. There are people we recruit, we intelligence officers are not spies. We recruit spies to steal secrets for us. Okay. And so some of our assets Russian citizens in the late 70s started to disappear and die horrible deaths. Ah, and okay. clearly, the head of CIA station there, a guy named Gus Hathaway, concluded that there was a leak and that the Russians were somehow figuring out who our assets were. And he was unable to find the leak. So in desperation, he calls a guy who he had known from previous briefings from NSA to come out to Moscow and see if he could find the problem. And um, when Gandhi came out, the first thing he was thinking about was the radar signals. But he heard some things with equipment that he brought out there that weren't really radar signals, but suggested that there was an implant that was sending out some short bursts. <clears> this <throat> sounded like clicks. Ah, okay. And uh, he thought it was in some kind of text device. He didn't know what it was. Um, so, uh, he, you know, the book tells the whole story of a six year saga of how he took that information. And then ultimately many years later was able to find the implants in the typewriter. But when they finally found them, what they were is the typewriters had transmitters and the hidden antenna, uh, and receiver <clears throat> was a way of, uh, of receiving those signals from inside the embassy. And so um, the State Department, while Gandhi was there, found that. Um, <clears throat> but they still weren't sure <clears throat> what the source of the implants were. They just knew that there was something. Uh, Gandhi had a pretty good idea what it was. But as we say in the book, the biggest obstacle wasn't the Russians, it was ourselves. There was a lot of uh, foot dragging and denial by State Department and CIA. They actually, at one point, uh, ordered Gandhi to stop his investigation, which he did. And it wasn't until a completely unrelated event years later happened that uh, the whole thing got turned on again, and he ultimately found the the bugs. Ah, okay, okay. Well, it, it seems like, I mean, all of this, all the events in this book happened nearly 40 years ago. Um, 
but you know the, the technology remains relevant today and given the pervasive nature of modern cyber warfare it seems like this is a reminder that we need to remain vigilant right not just of people in trench coats sneaking around back you know back corridors and stuff like that but also vigilant against things being implanted right um i mean in modern context there are things like key loggers that could get installed in systems i i have heard that at least with the CRT screen days, there used to be a way to actually view what was on a computer screen through a wall based on the radiation mm -hmm. that came out of a CRT screen. So right. there's, a, there's a lot of different, I, I believe they were calling this technical surveillance, right? A lot of yeah, well, the, the, yes, uh, technical surveillance, it has different names. Um, what you were referring to was called Tempest. Hmm. It's the emanation of unwanted classified signals that can be picked up passively without any implant. Um, and the Russians call it PEMIN, P -P -E -M -E -N. <clears throat> and it's, uh, although they think about it a little differently, um, we tend to think about preventing emanations from getting out. They think about that plus preventing stuff from getting in, <laughs> which is a very interesting difference. Um, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, the technologies are all kind of related in that um, with you put the laser microphones apart for a moment, they basically all have to do with radio frequency. And sometimes it's listening to what we call the baseband signal, the basic broad data or voice signal. And uh, sometimes <clears throat> it has to do with stimulating a response with a radar and getting a reaction. Um, but uh, yeah, these... Um, these techniques are very relevant today because um, the same techniques of radar flooding can be used to monitor what goes on on computers. And uh, I discovered evidence looking in the Russian literature, and I'm talking unclassified, open source, publicly available information security literature, <clears throat> in which they talk about injecting viruses into computers using radars at a distance. They called okay. it a viral gun. Yeah. And so, uh, that could, that now something like that could be relevant to Havana syndrome for reasons we can get into later. But um, the, you know, the bottom line is that you're absolutely right. Uh, this kind of tradecraft is extremely relevant today. And even more so because most companies, even most government agencies have no idea that it can even be done. Well, and there are so many different ways to do it. You mentioned laser microphones. That's something that actually I'd, I'd read about, I think, in Popular Science several years ago. And if, I, if I'm if i thinking of the same thing, that was one where you use basically an invisible infrared laser. You bounce it off a window, and then you can detect from the vibrations in the laser return what's being said in a room, right? Is that Well, sort of. Um, what you hear about is the window, but in fact, windows are very noisy because they respond to all vibrations from the ambient. Mm. So I would phrase it a little differently to say any vibrating surface. And it doesn't have to be the window. It could be a vibrating surface inside the room. For example, if you had a stereo in the room, that speaker is going to be vibrating. Or if you have a telephone receiver, <clears throat> or if you have a plant or a coffee cup, a paper cup, any of those things uh, vibrate and in theory could give you a signal. And generally, when you use a laser microphone, you try to find the thing that has the most signal to noise. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so again, we, we've been talking uh, predominantly about radar flooding and things along those lines. And, you know, as I was going through and looking at Moscow Station, I mean, even before I, I because there's lots of literature about there, you know, connecting these two, I said, wow, this could cause something like Havana syndrome. Um, it's been suggested that Havana syndrome could be the exposure to EM and microwave band radiation. Um, now, you've mentioned that you're not sure about that. I, I mean, are, well, um, first of all, as a scientist, um, <clears throat> I would have to say we always have to keep an open mind and we don't have a smoking gun. When we talk about the levels of radiation and the nature of the waveforms that were used in Moscow since the 70s, um, there's no evidence that those power levels and those waveforms could cause damage to the brain or other parts of the body. However, 
there is a fair amount of information that in different forms, even very, very, very low average power, but very, very high peak power, very short pulses could in fact cause problems. For example, there is a phenomenon called the Fry effect. And this is also called microwave hearing, where you can actually hear a radar. Raytheon originally discovered this um, when certain technicians were hearing clicks. And um, basically what happens is <clears throat> when you have a very high peak power, but it can be low average power, signal that impinges upon the, the brain and the media of the ear, it causes what are called thermoelastic shock waves. And those shock waves transmit to the cochlea as clicks. Ah. And so um, in certain levels of power, <laughs> that are thought to be below that which would cause brain damage, um, you can definitely hear. Now, the question then is, because a lot of the victims of Havana syndrome heard sounds that sound a whole lot like the Fry effect, that raised the question of, is this a very high peak power RF pulse? And the National Academy of Science who looked at this came up with the answer, yes, that is what they think it is. Um, and if you think about then why it's so hard to detect something like that, um, generally speaking, if you're trying to detect an RF signal, uh, you really need to know, know, if someone's trying to hide it, you need to know something in advance about it. What, uh, what is the carrier frequency? What is the pulse width and pulse repetition rate? What is the modulation scheme, if there is one, and so forth? If you don't know anything about it, and you have, for example, extremely short pulses, of which I'm talking maybe less than a nanosecond, the, the Fry effect uh, are on the order of a few microseconds. Um, but it, certainly with a few nanosecond pulses, if you had very high peak power pulses, but you spread the energy out so that they were low duty cycle, meaning they didn't happen very often, um, it would be extremely difficult to detect them against the normal RF background, particularly if they were randomly generated, where yeah. there wasn't any consistent pattern. And so um, it's not at all clear to me that <clears throat> you couldn't, if you wanted to, come up with a virtually undetectable by most normal means way of irradiating people or computers or both, um, using very, very, very short, semi-random uh, pulses. Because again, the, the amount of uh, average power would not be above the noise level. Yeah. But the peak power could be very, very high. And the way you do that is you cram a lot of power under an extremely short period of time. And again, the posited mechanism of damage to the brain or to the uh, acoustic media, by which I mean the inner ear, <clears throat> is thought to be these thermoelastic explosions, these little shock waves. One of the characteristics that <clears throat> is kind of the, I guess, gold standard for diagnosing Havana syndrome, because they've had trouble separating out who is just nervous and anxious and has a little kind of, oh yeah, I've got it too, and who is real. And so far that the, the main criteria for that has been uh, what they call auto lift damage. You have in your inner ear these sensors that tell you linear acceleration and gravity is one of them. And the people who have been affected by Havana syndrome appear to have a deficit in the ability to detect vertical. Ah. This is called the subjective visual vertical test. And and uh, basically they just, they, they're off a little bit. And so they have balance problems and so forth. And so autolith damage is kind of the necessary criteria for someone to say, yes, you have this damage. So you say, well, how did that damage happen? And I suspect that <clears throat> it could be that these vibrations are set up in tissues in the head, the brain, the skull, the skin, and fat, and so forth. Or they could also be set up directly in the labyrinth, the, the inner ear itself, or both. <clears throat> and so... <clears throat> I think that the National Academy, looking at all of this, concluded that the most likely 
possibility was a very, very short microwave pulse. Yeah. Well, let me go through some of the what was reported. Uh, so in terms of what was reported, the Havana syndrome events started with strange grating noises coming from a specific direction. Some people experienced pressure, vibration or a sensation uh, that they described being comparable to driving a car with a window partially rolled down. Uh, the noises typically lasted uh, from 20 to 30 seconds. I'm sorry, from 20 seconds to 30 minutes. It happened mm -hmm. while the diplomats were at home or in hotel rooms. Now, this last part was really interesting to me because, you know, as I was going through this, I thought, well, don't they shield these embassies, you know, especially with, I mean, what Gandhi had found, you know, 40 years ago. And then mm -hmm. I thought, you know what? I bet there is. I bet there's lots of shielding, but the homes and hotel rooms aren't going to be shielded, right? So people will be more vulnerable there. Yes, and the time of day may be more interesting, too, because maybe during that time you're not moving around and you're in bed and there's something about staying in one place that is helpful or various other um, issues. I mean, one of the things is, well, <clears throat> you know, you have a cell phone with you and generally most people put it down in their room with them. And it could be that the way they track and locate people has something to do with the, their cell phone signal or not. But <clears throat> there is definitely a pattern. Um, I will say that not all of the victims heard the sounds. Mm. Um, that you have a variety of different symptoms that have been described and not all are the same. But the one thing that seems to be common to almost all of the true victims, if we really know who they are, are the uh, the visual alignment to gravity issues. You know, basically what you do is if you imagine you put your head into a, a big white bucket so you couldn't see anything around and you had a vertical line at the end of the bucket and they told you to adjust the angle of that vertical line until it was perpendicular to the earth. Yeah. Um, people who have been affected with this autolith damage are off by maybe 15 degrees. And it's it's a it's a profound and robust effect. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, that it seems to be the one symptom that most or all of these victims have in common. Well, one of the things that I wanted to touch on that I think should highlight the importance of this situation is since 2017, it appears that this has expanded outside of Cuba. So what we call Havana syndrome has been documented in China, Washington, D.C., across Asia, as well as in Europe, Australia, and Colombia. And it seems to be predominantly affecting U.S. intelligence personnel and their immediate families. So could we describe Havana syndrome is spreading, I guess, in a sense. Would that be a way to describe it? Yes, yes. And um, there have been, it isn't just uh, intelligence officers. It's also State Department, um, Agency for International Development, and so forth. <clears throat> and there have been attacks on American soil. Um, there was a woman named Troyer who was uh, uh, um, the uh, Pence's national security staff who was attacked twice right next to the Oval Office between the old executive office building and the West Wing. And um, her symptoms are tracked very closely to the, the classic attack. There have been numerous other attacks in, in the United States. Um, there is one, and I'm not sure what I can say about this, but um, a, a federal law enforcement agency at a particular location was targeted. And again, we have to be a little careful. Are every one of these reported attacks the same? Um, are they all legitimate, quote unquote, attacks? There's some question about just which ones are and which ones aren't. And so I want to state these things as opinions on my part and not absolute fact. Yeah. Uh, but I'll tell you my opinion. Yeah. And I'm a brain scientist and I'm an expert in Soviet tradecraft that does this kind of thing. And I'm an RF expert. So I kind of have a convergence of all three of the disciplines. And in my opinion, the most likely is that <clears throat> this is uh, 
an attack uh, by a foreign power that may well have begun as a cyber attack to implant information in information devices, but which was discovered to also have a harmful effect on human targets. And I believe that when you look at the whole constellation of kind of harassments that the Russians have engaged in, from the colonial pipeline attack to cyber attacks on our financial systems, to election hacking, to, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious about what's behind some of these uh, rifle attacks on our power infrastructure. I don't think all of those are the Russians, but some of them could be. And, and this is kind of the Russians way of communicating to us that we're ticking them off due okay. to the expansion of NATO. And I think the uh, you cannot look at this stuff in a vacuum of foreign policy and national security issues writ large globally. If you look at the invasion of Ukraine, clearly the Russians, whether justified or not, are very upset about our behavior. Yeah. And yeah. they have engaged in a whole series of things communicating their displeasure. And I think it's entirely possible that the Havana syndrome attacks on individuals were a clear signal, you know, knock it off, back off, or there will be consequences to you. And we didn't listen, quote, not, I'm not saying we should have listened, but, um, and now we have the invasion of Ukraine. Again, I'm not going to say that's what happened, but that's one way of interpreting what we're seeing. Yeah. Now, so one thing I wondered also was, Again, you talked about radar flooding. If technology along these lines originated in Russia, you know, um, I mean, what if, um, you know, Cuba had picked that up through their relations? There was a part of me that wondered, what if Russia is, you know, hasn't been a part of this in 40 something years, some other power has picked this up, maybe some private organization or, you know, Lord knows who. And and so, yeah. you know, somehow this technology has jumped from where it originally started to some unknown power or organization or group of people, something along those lines. Yeah, I think that's entirely possible. In fact, one of the reasons I was able to talk about this in my book and that I'm able to talk about it now, because I still live under restrictions, I cannot talk about anything classified. Um, but I found all of this information in introductory information security textbooks in Russian universities. And what's in those textbooks is far more advanced than the most advanced stuff you can find over here that's classified, which which suggests to me, um, well, first of all, <clears throat> anytime you get something from Russia, you have to ask yourself, was motion da, was motion yet, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, is it real or are they putting out maskerovka or disinformatsia? You know, because they do that. So you always have to take with a grain of salt anything that's easily gotten from Russia. Is it true? Is it not true? So I want to go on the record as saying that just because I got it from those sources doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It might be a misdirection. Um, but um, let's just say I have built things based on that technology and it works. <laughs> you know, So uh, I don't think it's misdirection. So the point I'm trying to make is that if I can do it, in my laboratory, then a nation state sure as hell could do it other than the Russians. Yeah. Well, and, I... and the information is there. And you have to believe that, that you know, countries like, you know, China and North Korea and so forth, Iran, Syria, <clears throat> you know, they can do it too if they want to. Well, yeah, yeah. And that that is kind of what I wondered is, you know, once it's once it's proven, once it's demonstrated, right, then it could just, you know, it could jump and then there would be no way to know who was involved. Now, one of the other things that was interesting, and I think you'd alluded to this a little bit, is the back and forth inside of our own government on this. In January 2022, the CIA issued an interim assessment that ruled out foreign involvement in 976 of the thousand cases that were reviewed. But Less than a month later, the Biden administration released an executive summary indicating that radio waves could have caused some of the injuries. So it seems like there are two camps here and there's some confusion. Um, there's definitely uh, I've read a lot about, you know, mass hysteria. Right. Which I think is very poorly defined, especially in this case. And, you know, and then, as you've mentioned, there are also actual medical symptoms that come out of this. 
Um, do you know where some of the confusion, I guess, or some of where some of these conflicting opinions in the administration come from? Yes. Um, first of all, this is almost an exact repeat of what happened in the incidents in my book. It's almost 100% carbon copy. You know, you had strong evidence that something was going on. You had an investigation and then you had CIA coming out and State Department saying, no, there's n nothing to see here. Move on. Right. And then later in the end, it came out, oh, yeah, th there was something there. Um, my gut is that that's exactly what's happened. And you have to look at the political agendas. And by political, I don't mean red, blue, right, left. I mean, kind of bureaucratic uh looking after the interests. There's a saying in Washington, where you stand is where you sit. Mm. And if you think about the State Department and CIA, if this stuff's been happening to them and they can't detect it and they can't stop it, um, do they really want to find something or say it's not real? Yeah. And again, I don't know that this is a anything like a malevolent conspiracy where they they don't care what's true. They just want to protect their agency. I don't think that's what's going on. I think it's much deeper. And, you know, as intelligence analysts, we're trained to guard against biases where we see what we expect and we see what we want instead of what's really there. And my own belief is that if you have an agency like State Department or CIA, who, if they find out bad news, it's going to reflect badly on them. I think there's a natural unconscious bias to conclude that, you know, either there's nothing there or we really can't say anything about it. Um, <clears throat> that's what I think has happened. I think that this thing should be looked at by experts who don't have uh, a horse in the race. And the, the National Academy never got to look at really classified information. Like they never talked to me, for example. And I'm telling you things that are open and available, but I know a lot of things that aren't. And, uh, uh, you know, and so I think someone who has the expertise and is going to be truly objective, who, and, and I probably wouldn't be that someone because I have a history with CIA. Yeah. When I was at NSA and ODNI, I clashed with them, even though I went to work for them as a kind of a contractor for a while. Um they allowed me to be hired where the deputy director said, but watch your wallet, you know, because I took a bunch of money from them. So it would have to be someone with a lot of expertise who really was going to be truly objective. And I don't know that there is such a thing in our country. Yeah. You know, NSA has the expertise, but they've had their own, uh, you know, fights with, with CIA that are monumental. And that is an issue. And that's the main point I make in my book that the biggest obstacles we face in confronting these problems are internal bureaucratic turf and and those kind of problems, not the technology and not the enemy. Well, and again, let, let me let me close by thanking you so much for your time today and recommend The Spy in Moscow Station. That's your book that we've been discussing. An amazing book. And, it, you know, it, it describes the basis of a lot of stuff that may have bearing to Havana syndrome. So thank you for discussing that as well as Havana syndrome with me. Now, if it's okay, I'd like to ask um, what comes next for you? Are you working on more books in the future? And, and where can we see you next in the headlines? Ah, well, um, it's interesting. I am working on a new book with my wife and the working title is Competitive Wisdom, Stealing a Page from Nature's Playbook to Compete and Win. And um, my early roots were in prey predator biology. I got my PhD studying infrared reception in snakes, which is a mechanism of cutting through camouflage that <clears throat> various prey animals use. And so what we're doing in this new book is we're applying the uh, wisdom of like, if you're an octopus and you live right next to a shark, how do you stay alive? And so in the cyber domain, for example, when you're competing against cyber threats, you have to assume they penetrated you for all the reasons we just talked about. So on that assumption, what do you do? So we look at wisdom of, you know, three and a half billion years of evolution of how to do this. And that's that's the new project that we're working on. 
Wonderful. Well, Eric, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>